Hello everyone, welcome back. So in today's video, we're going to start from problem number nine. So we have already discussed prop till problem number eight. So this question is from projectile motion. So it's given that a ball is thrown from the location a zero comma zero of a horizontal playground with an initial speed of v naught and an angle of theta naught from the plus x direction. Okay, and then the ball is to be hit by a stone which is thrown from some other location which is at L comma zero. So the stone is thrown at an angle of 180 minus theta one from the plus x direction with a suitable initial speed, okay? So for a fixed value of V naught, so we are fixing the value of V naught, which is the speed of the ball. When theta naught and theta one are both 45 degrees, the time of collision is T1. And when the angles are 60 and 30 respectively, the time of collision is T2. So we have to find the square of their ratios. So let's say this is the origin. So the first ball is projected with an angle of theta naught and the stone is projected at an angle of 180 minus theta one with the plus x direction, which means this angle is theta one. And it's given that they are going to collide. So guys, the moment the ball and the stone is in air, both of them have the same acceleration of minus g, j cap. So their relative acceleration is going to be zero as both of them are flying with the same acceleration. If their relative acceleration is zero, then with respect to one body, the other body will appear to move in a straight line. Okay, so now for case one guys, both the angles are given to be 45 degrees. This angle is 45 and this angle is also 45 degrees. So now let's say the velocity of the second ball is actually some v dash. So now let's say Hey guys we take the stone as our frame of reference so we have to reverse and add velocity of the stone to the ball so it will be v dash at an angle of minus 45 degrees right so now the thing is the stone is a fixed point and if i want the ball to collide with the stone the resultant velocity of the ball must be along the plus x direction so which basically means v dash has to be equal to v naught okay because i want the vertical component to cancel out right okay so we can say that the time of collision is the, is the relative displacement which is given to be l divided by the relative speed so the relative speed is v naught by root 2 plus v naught by root 2 which is root 2 v naught so this is t1 okay okay so now for the second case guys the first angle is 60 degrees uh, and the second angle is 30 degrees. Uh, we want the resultant vector to be in the plus x direction. Okay, so I'll just draw a slightly different diagram. So the v naught makes an angle of 60 degrees, right? And I'm going to place v1's head on v naught's tail, right? And this is the resultant vector. So let's say this is v rel. Okay, so we want v rel to be in the plus, plus x direction, right? Now guys, this angle is 30 degrees, right? So which means this is going to be 90 degrees and this angle is going to be 60 degrees. So from here, the relative velocity, uh, in terms of v naught, we can say it is v naught secant 60. So this answer to out to be 2v0. So the time t2 required to cover a distance of l is l divided by 2v0. So the ratio t1 by t2 equals root 2. Uh, so the square of this will give the answer as 2. So the answer to this question is 2. Okay guys, so this is problem number 10. So in this question, we have a charge that is kept at the central point P of a cylindrical region. The two edges subtend a half angle of theta at P. When theta is 30 degrees, the electric flux through the curved surface of the cylinder is given to be phi. And when theta is 60 degrees, the electric flux through the same curved surface becomes phi by square root of n. So firstly, we can say that the net flux through the curved surface and two times the flux through one flat surface should be equal to the net charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. And this is uh, given to us by Gauss law. Okay guys, so the, the flux through the flat surface we can determine using concept of solid angle. So the solid angle subtended by the flat surface at the point P, if the semi-vertical angle of this cone is theta, is two pi times one minus cos theta. Okay, and for this point charge plus Q, the electric flux per unit solid angle, we can say it is Q by epsilon naught divided by four pi. And if I multiply it with the solid angle subtended by the small disc, I can get the flux through the flat surface. Right. And from here, the electric flux uh, through the flat surface comes out to be this particular value. So now all we have to do is solve equation number one and two. And finally, we'll get that the flux through the curved surface comes out to be Q by epsilon naught times cos theta. So the flux in the first case, which is given to be phi divided by the flux in the second case is basically the ratio of cos 30 and cos 60. So this is nothing but square root of three. Okay, so from here, the flux in the second case turns out to be the initial flux divided by root three. And they ask the value of square root of n here, that is going to be three. Now let's move to the next question. Okay guys, so this is question number 11. And just like every year, this is a question from prism. So we have two equilateral triangular prisms, which is P1 and P2 and they're kept with their sides parallel to each other uh, in vacuum. The light ray enters prism P1 at an angle of incidence of theta, such that the outgoing ray undergoes minimum deviation in prism P2. If the respective refractive indices of P1 and P2 are these two values, then we have to find the value of theta. Okay, so the refractive indices are given and it's also given that the ray undergoes minimum deviation in prism P2. Okay guys, so in the minimum deviation case, what happens is the incident ray to the prism, uh, after refraction, it becomes parallel to the base of the prism. Okay, and the angle of emergence and the angle of incidence are both equal in this case. And by Snell's law, we can also say that uh, the both the angle 
angle of refractions will also be equal. So basically uh, we can say I equals E and R1 equals R2. Okay, so now guys uh, R1 plus R2 is nothing but the angle of prism divided by 2 and this we can prove by using angle sum property on this triangle so this angle is 90 minus r this angle will also be 90 minus r so we can say 2 r equals a okay this would be a not a by 2 in the minimum deviation case both r1 and r2 will be equal and they will both be equal to a by 2 now in this case it's an equilateral prism so r1 and r2 both will be 30 degrees okay guys so let's say this is the incident ray and it makes an angle of theta right with the normal and let's say this is the first refracted ray and the angle of refraction at the other end is let's say r1 now the thing is guys the ray that is incident on the second prism after refraction it will be parallel to the base and this is because of the minimum deviation case right so this light ray will be parallel to the base and let's say this is the angle of emergence okay this is the minimum deviation case this angle will be 30 degrees and now we can apply Snell's law at, at this interface over here let's say this angle is alpha so 1 times sine of alpha equals mu 2 which is root 3 times sine of 30 which is half so from here alpha just comes out to be 60 degrees now guys these two lines are parallel to each other right so if this angle is 60 then this angle will also be 60 so now we can again apply Snell's law over here uh, mu 1 which is going to be root of 3 by 2 sine of r1 equals mu 2 sine 60 so from here r1 turns out to be 45 degrees uh, so let's say this angle is r2 guys so the sum of r1 and r2 again it is equal to the angle of prism and the angle of prism itself is 60 degree so we can say r2 is 15 degrees right and 15 degrees is half of 30 degrees so, so now all we have to do is apply Snell's law at this point so we can say sine theta equals mu times sine of 15 degrees now 15 degrees is half of 30 guys so that will be half of pi by 6 which is pi by 12 so theta turns out to be sine inverse of this particular value and if you check the options they just asking about this value beta which is 12 okay so that's the solution to this problem now let's move on to the next question okay guys so this is another problem from electrostatics so we have an infinitely long thin wire having a uniform linear charge density 5 nc per meter and it is passing through a spherical shell whose radius is 1 meter then we have a 10 nanocoulomb charge distributed over a spherical shell if the configuration of the charges remains static the magnitude of the potential difference between points p and r in voltage so so, so both the sphere and and the line charge are non-conducting and all we have to do is find the potential difference point p and r and again we only care about the magnitude so let's say we are trying to figure out vp minus vq this is minus the line integral of the net electric field dot dl and from the initial point to the final point okay so this is how we find out electric potential difference right now by superposition theorem guys we can say uh, e vector is nothing but e1 vector plus e2 vector dot dl so now as you can see we can separate out these two integrals so there will be an e1 dot dl component and e2 dot dl component so the reason that i wrote it down is that we can actually forget about the line charge and calculate the potential difference due to the sphere and then we can bring the line charge in forget about the sphere and now calculate the potential difference so, so that is what we are going to be doing so firstly let's write it down for the sphere so because of the sphere the potential at point p as so a point p is inside the shell its potential is, is going to be k times the charge on the sphere divided by its radius and the potential at point Q is going to be uh, K times the charge divided by distance of point R from the center of the sphere which is going to be 2 meters in this case okay so the potential difference after calculation comes out to be 45 volts so now let's talk about the line charge so for the line charge we can say VP minus VQ uh, equals 2 K lambda ln r2 by r1 so okay so if you guys don't know this formula all you have to do is uh, integrate the electric field which is 2k lambda divided by r dot dr so and if you do this line integral as you can see dr by r will give you a logarithm term and the initial limits will set from some general r1 to r2 and you'll get the potential difference as this particular value now the magnitude you can judge using the fact that in the direction of electric field the potential decreases and the direction of the field is in the plus r cap direction which means potential of point q is less than the potential of point p so vp minus vq is going to be r2 is going to be 2 meters r1 is 0.5 meters so so this is going to be ln4 and ln4 we can write it as 2 ln2 and after calculation the vp minus vq comes out to be plus 126 volts so now all we have to do is add the contribution due to the line charge and the sphere separately so the net potential difference delta v comes out to be 126 plus 45 which is equal to 171 volts okay so that's the answer to this question okay so this is question number 13 guys so we have a soap bubble and it is lying inside an air chamber at a pressure of 10 to the power 5 pascal so surrounding of the bubble has a pressure of p0 and it has a certain radius so that the excess pressure inside the bubble is 144 pascals the surrounding pressure p0 is given to be 10 to the power 5 
pascals and the air pressure inside is P0 plus 144 pascals. And then now the chamber pressure is reduced. So it has been reduced by a factor of 8 by 27 so that the bubble radius and its excess pressure now change. Okay guys, so now the thing is if we reduce the external pressure, the bubble is going to expand. Why? Because the external force applied on the outer surface of the bubble due to air pressure decreases, which means, which means the internal pressure is greater and the bubble will expand. And this will happen till an equilibrium radius is achieved. So inside uh, the soap bubble, gas will undergo some kind of expansion process. And in this process, all the temperatures remain unchanged. Okay, so we have to consider isothermal expansion of air inside. So now we have to assume air to be an ideal gas and the excess pressure delta P in both the cases to be much smaller than the chamber pressure. So the new excess pressure delta P is going to be. So now guys, the excess pressure uh, is given by, uh, you can figure out in multiple ways, but we can directly just apply young Laplace equation. So as this is a soap bubble, there will be two surfaces. So we have to multiply with 2T times 1 by R1 plus 1 by R2. And as this is a spherical soap bubble, both the radii of curvatures are the same. So this is going to be 2 by R. And the answer in this case is 4T by R, which most of you may be familiar with, right? Okay, so now let's consider the uh, process that is happening inside the air bubble, guys. So the initial so the initial pressure of, of air is 144 plus P0. And the final pressure is going to be the final excess pressure, which is what we have to determine, the surrounding pressure. And the, the surrounding pressure in the final case is 8 P0 by 27. Okay, so now it's given that the process is isothermal. So we can say P times V is going to be a constant. 144 plus P0, which is the initial pressure, times the volume. Now the volume is going to be proportional to R cube, right? So, so I'll just write the proportionality here. And this would be equal to the final pressure, which is delta P plus 8 by 27 P0 times RF cubed. Now guys, the 144 is negligible in comparison to P0. Uh, and it's given in the question that we have to neglect this anyway. So this is the order of P0 is 10 power 5 and the order of this guy is 100. So it thou it's 1000 times bigger. So we can neglect the 144. And here similarly, the, we can neglect the delta P. So if I neglect it, we can say the R final is going to be the cube root of 27 by 8, which is 3 by 2 times the initial radius. So the so the final radius of the sphere after expanding becomes one point times the initial radii of curvature. So now guys, the excess pressure is inversely related to the radius, right? So if the radius increases by 1.5 times, the excess pressure will reduce by 1.5 times. So the new excess pressure will be the original excess pressure, which was 144 times 2 by 3. Okay, and this comes out to be 96 pascals. Okay, guys, so that was it for this video. So now we only have four more paragraph questions to discuss. So that I'll be bringing another video. So if you enjoyed the video, please do like, share and subscribe. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching.